Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 7, Episode 15, The Showerhead. Happy New Year, everyone! I'm not doing it too late. It's not February. I would never Happy New Year someone in February. I just said it to a bunch of people on my son's basketball team today. So, you know, I don't think I am committing a faux pas. I hope everyone had a great holiday and uh, celebrated the new year, rung in the new year with a great attitude. I, I did. I have to say, I'm not a big like resolution person. I don't sit down and make goals for 2024 or, um, you know, write down my resolutions like I, I know some people do. And no judgment. That's great if that works for you. But I kind of came up with one on the fly when at the New Year's Eve party that I attended, a woman asked me, she's like, any resolutions for the new year? And I... My knee jerk reaction was just kind of be like, no, I don't really do resolutions. But then I really thought about it. And I had been thinking about it, oddly enough. And I just said, you know, I'm going to approach this year with more confidence. I've talked about it on this podcast, but just it's been a it, it was a rough year last year in my acting career. I just did not book at the normal rate uh, that I usually book. I also had a couple big disappointments with a few jobs that I did not end up getting, um, got really close and didn't get them. And yeah, so my in on the fly resolution when I was talking to my friend was just like, yeah, I just I want to get out of that mindset. I really did let it get to me a bit too much, especially towards the end of last year. I just I was kind of bitter. I was I was just I just had a bad attitude every time an audition notice would come in and I was told, oh, they want to see you for this role. I'd be like, well, I'll send in a tape, but I doubt I'm going to get booked. Like just going in with super shitty attitude. And that's kind of not me. And I didn't like that. So I just am like, you know what, whatever happens, happens. As long as I put my best foot forward, whatever cliche you want to use. I'm all about the cheesy cliches right now because I think it's going to help me. And it's just there's just everything's harder if you have a shitty attitude. So there's my advice for you for 2024. If you got a shitty attitude, stop it. Um, I did have a Seinfeld IRL moment. So this is something I introduced in the last episode and something I hope to keep doing going forward. So when I experience something in real life that I feel like could be on a Seinfeld episode or was on a Seinfeld episode and now I'm experiencing it, I just want to tell you guys about it. So my Seinfeld IRL was when I went to see with my mother, uh, we went to see The Color Purple, the new adaptation of it. On New Year's Day, we did a whole family movie day. Um, My daughter and her boyfriend went to see the Hunger Games movie. Yeah, I said boyfriend. I'm dealing with it. Um, (laughs) My son and my husband went to see Migration. And my mom and I went to see the color purple. And it worked out great. All movies were around the same time. We just had a fun New Year's Day movie day. Anyway, my mom and I are sitting there and this group of ladies comes in and sits right next to us. And they're talking super loud during the previews. I'm like, "Mm, mm, mm, mm." these this is sort of like the movie has started. Okay, if you talk during the dumbass commercials they have leading up to it, that's fine. But I think it was also annoying because I'm like, hey, I do kind of want to see these previews and listen to them without you guys like just barking back and forth to each other super loud. But also, it's like an excessive amount of previews. I think all of you, if, if you guys have gone back to the theaters after the pandemic, which I don't blame you if you haven't, but I don't know. I still like that experience every now and then. Not for everything, but every now and then. It is excessive. I I, I want to say it was a full 30 minutes of previews, which come on. <laughs> that's just that's a little bit like you're it's entrapment. Like you're in there, you can't go anywhere. You want to see the movie you paid for, but you have to sit through all of these previews and some of them are appropriate for the movie you're seeing and some of them you can just tell they throw in there and like no one's going to give a shit about who are who's seeing the color purple. Like sorry, I don't give a shit about some superhero movie or horror movie. Like, that's just not my thing. Anyway, 
So these ladies were talking really loud. <laughs> I did not call them out like Elaine did in the theater. You're talking. It's the previews. But luckily, they did They did quiet down once the color purple started. And I have to say, 10 out of 10, the color purple. I mean, I was a mess walking out of that movie. I was crying so hard. I, um, I never saw the original. I was a bit too young around the time that came out. And just never got around to seeing it uh, when I did get old enough to be interested in it. Uh, I do want to see it now. And I, I think I actually want to read the book as well that it's based on because, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> everyone in the cast is excellent. Uh, I loved the musical aspect of it. I'm not, you know, it's weird. I'm like a theater kid, technically, but I'm not a big fan of like movie musicals. I always get disappointed by them unless they're the ones from like the 60s, the 50s and 60s when they did it right. So I was kind of skeptical with that aspect of it, but I'm telling you, they they just masterfully put in songs at certain places, and they also made the songs pretty short, and they were very entertaining, so I was appreciative of that. But anyway, it was fantastic. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Like I said, I, I was a mess crying at the end, walking out of the theater, and then um, talking about it to to my husband afterwards, I like started crying again. I, I've only cried after a movie, like from the movie, and then continued to cry afterwards. I've only done that one other time in my life. And that was when I saw Philadelphia, the movie with Tom Hanks in the 90s. I was I was just a wreck after that movie. <laughs> I remember being in the car with my friends who I saw it with and I'm just like, I'm sorry, I just still have to cry. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, this is really embarrassing because <laughs> like the movie's over. It's fake, but it was powerful. That's another movie I recommend. Other than that, the break was, uh, it was a long break, but it was fun. The kids had a wonderful Christmas. Uh, my son, we surprised him with some basketball tickets. Uh, his favorite team, Golden State Warriors. His favorite player is Steph Curry, so that's why he loves that team. Well, and he likes it for other reasons, but Steph Curry is the main draw. And they happen to be in Denver playing the Nuggets. And he likes the Nuggets too. We're the national champs. I mean, <laughs> uh, he really does like the Nuggets too. But when the Warriors are in town and playing them, he's rooting for the Warriors. So we surprised him with tickets. My husband took him on Christmas Day, just the two of them. He scored seats right next to the tunnel where the Warriors came out. So he got fist bumps from like, every player from Steph. He got a fist bump from Steph. And he also got his jersey signed by a bunch of the Warriors players. I mean, it was like literally one of the best days of his life, maybe the best day of his life. And I got to see him on TV. They aired the, the game on ABC. And uh, you better believe I screamed and took a video of him leaning over and giving fist bumps to the players. It was just all so thrilling. But like all breaks, they must end. And to be honest, I'm very happy to be back to my routine. The kids are back to school. You know, the thing is, when it's a break for your kids, it's more work for the moms. And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that I really, that first day back <laughs> when they're at school, that's a good day. That is a good day. All right, let's get into this episode. The synopsis for the shower head is as follows. Low-flow showerheads are installed in the building, leaving everyone with flat hair. Newman arranges to secure replacements from the black market. Uncle Leo is offended by a joke Jerry made about him on The Tonight Show. George convinces his parents to move to Florida, leading Jerry's parents to move to New York. Elaine's passion for poppy seed bagels causes her to test positive for opium. This episode was written by Peter Melman and Marjorie Gross. Okay. I usually try to let this go because, as I've said before on this podcast, these synopses are written so badly. For those of you who may not know, new to the podcast, welcome. I read these from the coffee table book that came with the box set DVD of all the seasons. And I just think they got some intern who maybe never watched the show and skimmed it, <laughs> fast forwarded through it. Elaine's passion for poppy seed 
Bagels? She's not eating a bagel. She's eating a muffin, you butt plug. All right, so we start out in a doctor's office. Elaine is getting a physical, and she's getting that physical because she was sent over by Mr. Peterman because they are going to go to Kenya together. She's telling this doctor all about why she's going. They're going to knock off these sandals that the Maasai wear. (laughs) She's very excited. The doctor, on the other hand, couldn't be less interested and asks for her urine sample, and she says, right. My take on this scene... I love when an episode opens with Elaine. I mean, and no other principal characters. It's just an Elaine scene. That's great. And we get a lot of information here. So it's it's expositional, but I think it's done well. You know, she's telling a very uninterested doctor the details of why she's going to go on this trip. And, you know, uh, it's a mission for the company. And we see right off the bat how excited Elaine is for this trip. And you also get the sense that she's taking this mission, as she puts it, as like the source of pride for her career. You know, it's a big deal to be tapped by Peterman to do this. So I love that we see all of those emotions in this scene. It really sets the tone of where Elaine is in her storyline. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. (laughs) George is so horrified that Elaine's going to Africa. You know how hot it gets there? like 150 degrees. Your your skin is going to be simmering with boils. Elaine's like, come on. She just laughs it off. Jerry asks George if he wants to go to The Tonight Show. And he's like, yeah, I do. And my parents want to as well. And Jerry says, oh, my parents will be there. Elaine's like, The Tonight Show? Jerry explains that, yeah, they're in town this week. Do you want to go? Are you doing new material? No. Eh, Elaine's not interested. (laughs) Kramer peeks in and he says that the super is changing his shower head. Jerry's like, yeah, I know. They're low flow, you know. Kramer's like, oh, I don't like the sound of that. Elaine asks Jerry why his parents are in New York. And he explains, you know, they were humiliated from the impeachment. So they're moving into this new development, but it's not ready yet. So they're in seclusion at Uncle Leo's apartment. And that Leo isn't actually there. He's moved in with his girlfriend. (laughs) George asks the question. (laughs) Leo's having regular sex? I know, it devalues the whole thing. Such a great moment. Jerry gets a phone call from Morty, and he's asking when they have to be at The Tonight Show. And he gets all confused when Jerry (laughs) explains that, yeah, they've been taping it early and airing it at 1130 for 30 years, Dad. And then Jerry hangs up. Elaine poses a question to Georgie about why his parents never moved to Florida. This really kind of like takes George aback. He's like, I don't know why. They were tired. No economical reason for them to be here. They have no friends, no social reason. Yeah, you're all grown up. Yeah, they're through ruining my life. What the hell are they still doing here? He takes the Del Boca Vista pamphlet and says, uh, I'm going to get back to you on this and exits. Helen then calls on the phone asking Jerry where she can get a lot of ice. <laughs> I don't know. How about an ice tray? You know, dad just called. And she says, yeah, his phlebitis is acting up. And Jerry's like, okay, I got to go. He tells Elaine, this is brutal. You know, any thought pops into their head, they call because it's a local call now. Plus, they pop in. I mean, he's used to a 1,200-mile buffer zone. Elaine asks, they have no idea when they're going back to Florida? The only way to do that, he says, is to get Leo to move back into his place. (laughs) How's that going to happen, Elaine asks. Uh, My take on this scene uh, I love George being so upset. It's it's so hilarious. He's so baffled that she's going to Africa. And it's also pretty ignorant as well. He actually sounds like my father-in-law. Like, oh, I hear it gets like 150 degrees. And it's like, you can't convince him otherwise. It's like, no, do a little research. But I do love that, of course, George brings that up to her. And he's so, he's like so bothered by it. I love that performance. Uh, Elaine's role in this very lengthy scene is just to sort of receive and not really delivering any punchlines or comedic moments, except that one where she has no interest in seeing Jerry and The Tonight Show. That's pretty funny. The no new material bit is always is always funny. But with how long the scene is, I just ah, I feel like they could have given her something else, something more. I mean, I do like this scene, but maybe we could have heard more about Elaine's trip or why she's so excited about being picked for it. Just something, anything. All right, next we're in Monks and Jerry and Leo are having lunch. (laughs) Jerry asks about Lydia, Leo's girlfriend. Oh, he is just head over heels for her. And Jerry's like, I don't know how you do it. 
says a man like him limiting himself to one woman? Leo's kind of confused. He takes a bite of his burger and he's upset because it's medium when he said medium rare. And he bets the chef is an anti-Semite. Jerry's like, he can't even see you. He doesn't know who you are. You don't just overcook a burger. (laughs) Anyway, Jerry steers it back. He tells him he should be out there swinging. You know, you can get any woman you want. Tell Lydia it's been real. Move back into that bachelor pad and put out a sign open for business. Well, Jerry's plan doesn't work. Leo is too smitten with Lydia. He can't see a flaw. Jerry says, eh, keep looking. All right, next we're in Elaine's office. Peterman is at Elaine's door, and she mentions how short the Maasai are, and she's going to look like a giant. And she laughs and laughs. But Peterman has some bad news. She cannot go to Africa. What? Why not? It's your urine, Elaine. You've tested positive for opium. She says this must be a mistake. I've never done a drug in my life. Not a chance, Peterman says. And he's going to have to find someone else to accompany him. He says the dark continent is no place for an addict, Elaine. And she tells him, look, there must be something wrong with this test. Let me take another one, please. I'll take a pop urine test. He agrees to that. So she starts chugging water. I'll be ready in three minutes. Uh, My take on this scene, once again, I really enjoy JLD's portrayal here of how excited Elaine is, that sort of extended laugh after her giant comment. Like, it goes on like a second and a half too long, but I love it. It's so great. The laugh acting by JLD, always flawless. And then that turn after Peterman reveals the bad news about her urine. Uh, And I, I love the chugging the water at the end. It's a good physical gag. All right, next we are at the Costanza's house. George enters talking about how bitter cold it is. Frank said he couldn't feel his extremities when he went out earlier. What extremities? (laughs) I still don't understand why that's such a, like, why that's such a burn. But it is a burn. Like, I get the context of it, but it's like, I, like, what is, what does that mean? Like, oh, you don't have arms or legs? Or is she talking about, like, his penis? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Of course, that's where my mind goes. But (laughs) at any rate, I love the delivery. It's still a funny line. George then tells them the temperature in Florida. The life expectancy in Florida is 81. In Queens, 73. So, George, why are you here? He says, what? Can't come and visit my parents? And he starts waving the Del Boca Vista brochure in front of them. And Estelle asks what that is. And he's like, oh, that's where uh, the Seinfelds are moving. Yeah, they got a great deal. And then he names other things about Florida. Hyalai and the dolphins. And Estelle rebuffs both with extreme prejudice. She says, are you trying to get rid of us? <laughs> rid. The word is care. I care about your comfort, be it here in Queens or 1,200 miles away. All right, next, we're back at the doctor's office. Elaine is awaiting her results. The doctor opens her chart and just shakes his head. Oh, Elaine can't believe it. No? My take on this scene, uh, there's not much to say here, just her big reaction. Uh, but I do want to say, this doctor is the worst. First of all, he's super uninterested in what Elaine is telling him in that first scene. And then he just, like, shakes his head here. Could you be less helpful? <laughs> and I think most doctors would, you know question her about poppy seeds, maybe. I'm sure it happens more often than you think. And probably if she's just eating poppy seed muffins, I'm sure it's like a trace amount. Look, I know this would ruin the the plot for Elaine. (laughs) We just have to have this doctor be terrible and not even suggest that she might be eating stuff with poppy seeds. But at any rate, I hate this doctor. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Kramer enters with flat hair, calls out for Jerry, and Jerry comes out of his bedroom with flat hair. (gasps) They got you too. They talk about how the showers are terrible. There's no water pressure. Neither of them can get the shampoo out. And Kramer is not himself without a good shower. And Jerry's like, well, what about me? I'm going to have to shower in the dressing room at the Tonight Show. Kramer leaves saying he needs to find another shower. So then he goes over to Newman's place and (laughs) Newman enters with flat hair. They got you too. He says, this is awful. I'm not Newman. All right, next we're back at Elaine's office. Elaine's at her filing cabinet when Kramer enters, and she's like, oh, Kramer, you look terrible. He asks for her key so he can go shower at her place because there's no water pressure. She's like, well, why don't you just go to Jerry's? Well, he's got nothing and Newman's got nothing. We see Peterman walk by and pauses to listen. Kramer says that, you know, she's the only one who has the good stuff and he needs it bad, baby, because he feels like he's got bugs crawling up his skin. 
Well, Peterman, of course, thinks he's some drug addict and comes in and throws Kramer out. You're not going to turn this office into a den of iniquity. He pushes Kramer out the door. Kramer tries to enter again, only to get the door slammed in his face. <laughs> Elaine freaks out. Mr. Peterman, what are you doing? Peterman takes Elaine by the shoulders and sits her down, tells her she needs help and that he, too, had problems with drugs in the past and tells her, of course, in a boring catalog type story. And she's like, look, I don't know what is going on. I am not addicted to anything. Oh, Elaine, the toll road of denial is a long and dangerous one. The price? Your soul. And then he tells her that she has until five to clean out her desk. She's fired. Uh, my take on this scene, once again, it's an entertaining scene, but JLD gets zero comedy here. It's all Kramer and Peterman. And I, I have to praise Michael Richards. I mean, <laughs> that fall outside of her office door is probably one of the funniest physical comedy moments of the series. I mean, he like almost like floats down. It's it's just brilliant. I mean, he never disappoints when he does physical comedy. And I just this one moment I had to call that out. And I'll just say it here. This is a pretty weak storyline for Elaine. The lack of comedic moments JLD gets for this episode is so disappointing. It's She's just very underutilized in this episode. Maybe there could have been some other moments where she could have been mistaken for an addict by Peterman, something in her behavior that was misunderstood. I don't know. But JLD, you deserved more. All right, next we are in Jerry's dressing room. Helen is disappointed in the food choices. All they serve is chicken? And Morty tells her to put it in her purse. We'll take it home. George enters with his parents. Hello, Seinfelds. Frank is impressed with the dressing room. They treat you like Tuscanini. And Estelle tells Jerry she's so nervous for him. Jerry jokes, uh, actually, I'm drunk. George asks about uh, Florida to the Seinfelds. And Morty says, yeah, we just bought a new place down there. Estelle's like, yeah, we were looking at the brochure. Ooh, the Seinfelds get very serious. Why, are you thinking about moving? And Frank says, no. And Morty says, good, because there's nothing available in that development. You're telling me there's not one condo available in all of Del Boca Vista? That's right. How'd you get yours? God lucky. Does anyone notice what this sounds like? Tuscany, the maestro. I believe the lines are even the same. And I have to say, they didn't even point that out in the extras. I noticed that all on my own, guys. Very, I hope you're proud of me. Anyway, um, <laughs> another thing to bring up here. If you're familiar at all with the bloopers of this show, you know that Jerry Stiller trying to get Del Boca Vista out of his mouth was very difficult for him. <laughs> a lot of great bloopers with that. And even in the one they keep, you can see a little bit of a hesitation. All of Del Boca Vista. Anyway, back to the scene. Jerry, he just knows where this is going. He carts them out. I, I know this doesn't seem like work to any of you, but if you could conduct the psychopath convention down the hall, that'd be great. <laughs> I could need some space. <laughs> and if you notice, Estelle breaks when she's like looking at him and he says that. It's a great line. And apparently he came up with that in rehearsal. They did, they did say that in the extras. All right, next we are in Monk's. Elaine is talking to a waitress, you know, just so upset about what happened. How could she have tested positive for opium twice? The waitress seems baffled as well. Yeah, it's hard to figure. She's lost her job. She can't go to Africa. I was going to meet the Bushmen of the Kalahari. Oh, the Bushmen and the Bushwomen. Okay, I do want to note here, they did say in the notes about nothing that it's a very derogatory term to say Bushmen and Bushwomen. They probably didn't say Bushwomen, but Bushmen was something that, that the colonizers kind of call them, and it's, it's a derogatory term. But so when I'm saying it, I'm just quoting the episode. I don't condone the use of that term. There's a man at the counter, and he excuses himself into the conversation. He says, I noticed you're eating a poppy seed muffin. Elaine's like, yeah, I eat these all the time. Well, you know what opium is made from. <gasps> Poppies! The actress in this scene is Michelle Bonilla. She plays the waitress. And uh, she's done a lot of voiceover work and has appeared in ER, 911 Lone Star, and Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. I chose all medical <laughs> dramas. <laughs> she's also a very accomplished writer and advocate for the Latino acting community, as well as LGBTQ causes. Um, and I like her as a waitress. I think she's, <laughs> she's very sweet. She seems so genuinely bummed for Elaine. And my take on this scene, 
Obviously, the scene is to reveal that Elaine's been eating poppy seed muffins this entire time. In fact, in the first scene in Jerry's apartment, you can see that she's warming them up. Uh, she, she's got two muffins on her plate. So I, I like that they kind of planted that early, <laughs> planted the seeds early. Yeah. Um, I mean, the scene is fine. I do like the interaction with the waitress, but overall, it's meh. All right, next, we are at The Tonight Show. Jay Leno is interviewing Jerry. And he noticed some some people back there. He got some family. And Jerry's like, yeah. And he starts talking about his crazy family. Tells about how Leo thinks everyone who wrongs him is an anti-Semite. So we see a shot of Lydia and Leo on their bed. And she is just laughing and laughing at Jerry's jokes about Leo. She even taps him on his arm. <laughs> and Leo is not happy. Uh, I tried to look up this this actress who plays Lydia, but she's uncredited. I guess laughing out loud doesn't get you a credit since it's not technically dialogue. I don't know. But at any rate, I think she does a good job. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Jerry's on his phone and when the call is answered, he launches into how Leo and Lydia broke up because of his bit on The Tonight Show. She thought it was funny, so he accused her of being an anti-Semite. And now he's moving back into his place and his parents are going to have to go back to Florida. Well, it turns out Jerry has the wrong number. (laughs) Oh, I'm so sorry. And he hangs up. Kramer enters in his robe. Jerry tells him the news about his parents moving back to Florida. He's so excited. And Kramer is not giving it to him. He's not giving him the reaction he wants. Well, it turns out he's just so grossed out from taking a bath, Jerry. He said it was disgusting having all these organisms, having sex all around him. And Jerry points out, you know, the hot tub he had. Oh, Jerry, that was superheated water. Nothing could live in that. He offers Kramer some chicken, which, of course, he takes. Elaine enters, and she says, this you're not going to believe. I figured out why I've been testing positive for opium. Poppy seeds! Poppy seeds! Kramer's like, yeah, that makes sense, and offers her some chicken, which she takes. Then she says she's going to take another urine test later, hopefully get her job back, and then she'll be on her way to Africa. Newman arrives, and he wants to talk to Kramer and Jerry privately. He tells Elaine to, uh, hey, sister, take a hike, and <laughs> shoves her out of the apartment. Tells them about some black market shower heads that he got his hands on, made in the former Yugoslavia. And he asks them, are you in? Kramer's down, and <laughs> Jerry unenthusiastically agrees with the one finger. <laughs> uh, my take on this scene, uh, it's just another scene for Elaine to get more information out, Um and I have to say, I, even watching this back in 1996 when it aired, the chicken, I just knew the chicken was going to have poppy seeds. It's just very predictable. Just another kind of fault with this whole storyline and the way they've executed it. I do like the fun moment between Newman and Elaine. It's funny, mostly because of Newman. I like how he calls his sister. All right. Uh, next, we're at the Costanza's place. Estelle says, George, we have big news. They're moving to Florida. Of course, George goes ape shit. <laughs> so, so happy. Yeah, what do you need this cold weather for? Frank says it's nothing to do with weather. They're moving there because the Seinfelds don't want them to. They're moving for spite. No one tells Frank Costanza what to do. <laughs> George yells back at him in agreement. So happy. So, George, will you come visit us? Every chance I get, George lies. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Oh, George enters Boston, tells Jerry how his parents are moving to Florida to Del Boca Vista, and they're both so happy for each other. We can visit together every five years. And then George tells him, you know why they're moving back? To spite your parents. Jerry's like, they're crazy. I know, they're out of their minds. Jerry's like, well, my parents are moving back too. Beautiful. All right, next we're in Leo's apartment. Helen and Morty are packing up, and Morty's pretty bummed. He's not ready to go back to Florida. I love the way he says Florida. Florida. Yeah, Helen wonders. He was getting along so well with that woman. What happened? The phone rings and Morty answers. This is Frank Costanza. What do you want? And Frank tells him how they're moving into Del Boca Vista lock, stock and barrel. They're going to be at the pool, at the clubhouse. We're going to be all over that shuffleboard court. And I dare you to keep me out. (laughs) Hangs up very passionately. And Morty hangs up, says they are not going back to Florida. All right, next in Jerry's apartment, Jerry and George are enjoying some beers to celebrate because we all know Jerry doesn't have champagne. 
Jerry tells him how much his life is going to improve because his parents are moving. Just more energy, more self-confidence than you've ever dreamed of. The phone rings, and it's Morty calling. He asks Jerry if they can move in with him for a while. We hear a bottle break. Jerry has dropped his beer in shock. He asks, why do you, why do you have to move in here? He says that the Costanzas are moving to Del Boca Vista. Yeah, but it's a big complex. He says, you don't understand. You have to have a buffer zone. Yeah, yeah, okay, c- come over here. He hangs up, tells George they're not going to Florida. They're moving in here. George asks why. Because your parents are moving there, Jerry explains. Y- you gotta do something. George points out, you know, sorry, you had your buffer zone for many years. It's my time to live, baby. You know what you're doing, don't you? You're killing independent Jerry. And Jerry says, I need to talk to my Uncle Leo. I think he might have made a big mistake. All right, next we're in Monks, and Jerry and Leo are back in the booth. Leo is so confused to move back with Lydia, and Jerry (laughs) pretty much gives him the exact opposite speech of what he said before, tells Leo he's disgusting in a lot of detail, and if any woman can stand to be with him, to hold on to her like grim death, which is not far off, by the way. But she's an anti-Semite. Can you blame her? All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Helen and Morty are unpacking their stuff. Elaine enters, sort of surprised to see them. Oh, hi. And she's also picking at her teeth. Elaine then looks at that finger that was just in her mouth and sees a poppy seed. Oh, no, it must have been in the chicken. Oh, I'm dead. I'm going to the doctor's in a half an hour. Helen's like, why? Uh, It's a long story. Helen says, just a second, I have to go to the bathroom. Elaine stops her. What are you going to do in there? What am I going to do in the bathroom? She tells Helen, I need your sample. You want my urine? She needs a clean urine sample from a woman. Oh, I don't know. Well, Elaine begs her and she's like, well, what am I going to do it in? What are those glasses? Jerry's glasses? Yeah, he won't mind. You're his mom. And Helen has a hard time choosing which glass, a coffee cup, a juice glass, a milk glass. (laughs) Elaine is getting so impatient. Pick a glass, Mrs. Seinfeld. My take on this scene. Okay, we finally get some Elaine comedy here. And with Helen, yay. I love a two funny ladies combination, of course. JLD, of course, is great. But I also love Liz Sheridan's like panicky portrayal here as Helen. Like as she's being pushed over to the cabinet by Elaine, she's all, oh, okay, uh, what glass? Like it's just such a mom thing too to like want to choose the appropriate glass (laughs) to pee in, (laughs) to give to this woman. (laughs) Just what a fun moment. All right, next we are at the showerhead van um, in a back alley. Kramer and Newman are meeting with the black market showerhead guy. And they end up wanting the one that he actually doesn't sell because it's for circus elephants. But they don't care. They want power, man. But not for Jerry, though. He's delicate. All right, now we're back at Leo's place. (laughs) Helen and Morty are unpacking. Yeah, it's nice being here. Jerry's place was too small. And Morty's like, what the hell is going on with Leo and this girlfriend? First he breaks up. Now he's back with her. There's a knock at the door. And we hear from outside the door that it's the super... We're installing new low-flow shower heads in all the bathrooms. Peter Melman's voice, by the way. And Morty does not like the sound of that. All right, next we're in Peterman's office and Elaine's place. Elaine and Peterman are on the phone, and he says that due to her clean urine test, he is reinstating her. Oh, she's so happy. What a load off. So, when are we going to Africa? And he says, I'm afraid I can't take you. What? He tells her that according to the urinalysis, she's menopausal and has the metabolism of a 68-year-old woman. But I wanted to see the Bushman. Oh, and one more thing. You may have osteoporosis. <laughs> uh, my take on this scene, I think it's a really funny resolution to this plot. Like I said, I, the plot is very average to me, but I think it's a funny way to wrap it up. Now, of course, to refuse a woman an opportunity in her career because she's menopausal is so fucking wrong and could never legally be done. But it works for this. You know, who gives a shit? (laughs) I mean, this is the 90s. It's Seinfeld. I get it. And we also get a little moment of choked up Elaine, which in an episode of light Elaine comedy, I will take it. (laughs) I wanted to see the Bushman. All right. And then lastly, we are on the street. Helen and Morty have flat hair. (laughs) And they're saying goodbye to Jerry in front of a cab to take them to the airport. 
Morty says the first thing he's going to do when he gets to Florida is take a shower. And Jerry sneaks in the resolution to the Costanza's plot point, saying, oh, they changed their mind about moving down to Florida. They couldn't stand to be away from George. George must be happy. You have no idea. Then we cut to the Costanzas. George is wedged in between Estelle and Frank, like literally no buffer at all. And Frank says he wants him to take his swim trunks. Why would he want your swim trunks? Why should they go to waste? (laughs) Just uh, the perfect Costanza moment to illustrate why the hell George wants them 1,200 miles away. And then we have a tag to the episode. Kramer gets in his shower with his new Commando 480 shower head and gets blown out of his tub. All right, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. Life is tough. The world is falling apart and people are the worst. And you need to deal with it in any way you need, man. But unfortunately, there are still uptight wet blankets out there who need to make sure you run the straight and narrow. When my boss said that they were conducting a surprise drug test for everyone, oh, man, my stomach dropped. I mean, doing blow is the only way to get through the day as an ink stop manager. Sounds like he needed to get down with OPP, old people's pee. Hi, I'm Peg Kalahari founder and owner of OPP, a service that provides hard-working drug enthusiasts access to clean urine. Why old people's pee, you ask? Let's face it, most old people can barely ingest a Cheeto, let alone the kick-ass stuff you party with. Plus, these geezers need money. So I put out an ad for some old fogey piss, and OPP was born. Order your first pint of OPP by visiting our website, www.finallyoldpeoplehaveause.wiz. Along with your vacuum-sealed packet of pee, you will also receive a picture and bio of the old-ass fossil that donated that very pee. So keep on smoking, snorting, and shooting up, because OPP will keep all your secrets. Thanks to generous old farts who need money for their heart medicine. Old People's Pee. They kill the environment. This is the least they can do. And we're back. Okay, so in the extras for this episode, the commentary was actually done by none other than Jason Alexander and JLD. I will say they just laughed really hard throughout the episode <laughs> at each other's performances. You, They rarely laugh at themselves, which is, you know, good and humble. But um, yeah, man, did they really enjoy uh, everyone else in this episode. And... Holy shit, I cannot, I'm like a little upset that I did not know this after all these years. But in the commentary, Jason Alexander points out that the man who played Jay Peterman now owns Jay Peterman. I was like, whoa, 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 where's the pause button? So I looked it up and sure enough, in 1999, John O'Hurley, who plays Jay Peterman on Seinfeld, invested in the relaunch of the company and since then has been a part owner and member of the board of directors. Board of directors, look at you. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> I did not, I had no clue. I feel like that's a piece of Seinfeld trivia I should know. But yeah, thanks to this episode, I learned that. Jason Alexander also just marveled at, oh man, we used the full bench for this episode, meaning they're just, everyone's in it. We got both sets of parents. We got Peterman, we got Newman. It's just, he was like, oh, this is a beautiful, beautiful full bench that we used for this episode. So I just thought that was a cute way of putting it. Now back to that blooper that I talked about, the whole Del Boca Vista for Jerry Stiller for him to get that out. Of course, Jason Alexander was present for that. And he's like, it took... I'm not even kidding, a good 45 minutes to get that man to say (laughs) Del Boca Vista correctly. But it was a delight the entire time. It was so much fun. Um, In the notes about nothing, there was some deleted dialogue in the beginning of that scene at Jerry's place where (laughs) George is freaking out about how hot Africa is. And he was also supposed to say, what about Ebola? You just going to shrug that off? And Elaine's response was something like, well, it's better than whatever you're afflicted with. Meh, not great. All right, now it's time to move on to Greg's sack lunch. Greg is our most dedicated contributor to this podcast, and every week he sends us a sack full of his thoughts. The first thing I find in Greg's sack are his overall thoughts. He says, this is another one of those episodes that I forget exists. 
I remember parts of it, but this isn't one I've seen a million times like others. So watching it this time was nice, almost like seeing it for the first time. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I certainly don't rank this as a top episode, but once you watch it, you're like, oh, this is this is a solid episode of Seinfeld. All right, next in Greg's sack are his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. He says Elaine's best scene is when she's trying to rush Mrs. Seinfeld in order to get her urine. The panic just because she wants to see the Bushman. I love how she screams, Mrs. Seinfeld, choose a glass, pick a glass, Mrs. Seinfeld. <laughs> okay, controversial opinion. I'm not, I'm actually not crazy about that line delivery. I don't, it's a little much. It's a little much for me. I don't enjoy hating on performance by JLD, but it's not really hate. It's just kind of like, mm, it's a bit much. Next, Greg says, every other great scene for me isn't an Elaine one and is mostly Frank Costanza or Uncle Leo. They carry this episode over the main four. Oh my gosh, a hundred percent. The elders of the episode make it fantastic. Next, I find in Greg's sack his scene swap idea. He says, there is so much going on with the Costanzas and the Seinfelds that even though Elaine's opium thing is given significant time, it's just not a funny enough story for me. It would have been better to loop her into something else happening here. Maybe have her involved with George trying to convince his parents to move to Florida. Considering she was the first to ask George why his parents hadn't moved to Florida, it would have been good to tie her into it more. Um, Yes, we are totally on the same page, Greg. I'm going to get into this a little bit more in my final notes, but I don't know how she would have been looped into the other storylines, but it it needed to happen. I mean, this opium thing, I think it died like pretty early on in the episode. Uh, And you're right, it it does have significant time. We we see a lot of, you know, we see a whole arc with it. But um, yeah, it doesn't do it for me. It's not it's not that funny. It's not terrible. I just feel like they needed to be more creative with it. Right next are Greg's extra thoughts. He says, I love Uncle Leo. The Costanzas are the best and the Seinfelds are great as well. But Uncle Leo popping up from time to time is always a great story. He's so believable in his weirdness. I don't like Jerry making fun of him to Jay Leno. You can see he was hurt by that. The look in his eyes, the acting was very on point. I agree. (laughs) I, I'm not going to say I don't agree with Jerry doing that because, I don't know, part of me thinks like, hey, he should be kind of flattered he's talking about him, but it's like the whole anti-Semite thing. So I guess it's a touchy subject. But I think you're right. Len Lesser, who plays Leo, the, it, it's the eyes. You're completely right. He's just, he looks, I, for me, I feel sympathy for him when he's like, look at you, you're disgusting. And he's just like, he's got this look in his eyes like, What? <laughs> It is such great acting. And his background, Len Lesser, was in a lot of dramas, I think a lot of Westerns. I think he was actually in The Outlaw, Josie Wales, which is mentioned in a Seinfeld episode. But anyway, yeah, I I completely agree. Len Lesser, Leo, everything about his performance is is just perfect. I feel the same way about Jack Klompas. Like that actor, (laughs) he's talked about it uh, a couple episodes ago, but man, like every, every delivery of a line by Jack Klompas is its perfection. Greg goes on to say, also regarding Uncle Leo, this episode has both him and Frank Costanza, but do we ever see them together ever in the series? I don't think so. Imagine that argument, missed opportunity. Ooh, that's a great question. I I can't think of a scenario where they were together ever. And yeah, it's it almost feels like they would be frenemies. Like they would hang out like he'd go to the billiard room, <laughs> the place to be, <laughs> Uncle Leo would, but they would just like fight all the time or something. I Yeah, I think that that is definitely a missed opportunity. 100% agree, Greg. Next, Greg says, the hair bit from the low flow showers is too funny. It's such a stupid visual, but it really makes me laugh, especially when Newman comes in or the Seinfelds at the very end. I agree. It's such a simple, funny visual gag. <laughs> And it does. It always makes me giggle. It's like, especially I think the most dramatic change is with Kramer because he's, you know, got the the crazy hair usually all just like standing up. So it's it's brilliant that he's the first reveal of what the low flow shower heads are doing to them. But yeah, completely agree. It's very stupid. But sometimes the most stupid is the most funny. 
And finally, Greg says, Happy New Year, Shivani, and everyone listening. We will finish this series in 2024, and then I'll have to get Shivani to do a new Adventures of Old Christine podcast. Oh, (laughs) I've thought about what is going to happen post Seinfeld. You know, um, I do love doing this podcast, but I think I would enjoy a break. But Greg, don't think I haven't thought of that because I never watched New Adventures of Old Christine. I know my parents loved it. Um, I just, it's, this is going to sound super weird, but like something about those CBS sitcoms, I just never, ever got into them. It was something about the lighting or the sets or so. I, I know this sounds bonkers. And now I'm thinking, was it a CBS sitcom? I thought it was. Whatever network it was. I just... As much of a fan as I was and am for JLD, and and even like it, she won all these awards for playing that role. I mean, it was a critically acclaimed show. I just was like, yeah, I'm all set. And I really think it was because of weirdo lighting and a network I just didn't enjoy watching. I'm weird, you guys. I, I don't know what else to say. Thank you so much, Greg, for contributing your thoughts. We always enjoy them. And now it's time to close Greg's sack lunch. All right, moving on to my favorite Elaine moments. Well, just like Greg, it's that scene where she asks Helen for her urine. <laughs> it's the it's the best Elaine scene by far. And in that scene, I see I love that little moment of realization like, oh, she's going to the bathroom. <laughs> like it's it's a really great expression on her face and then that run over, what are you going to do in there? It's it's a very funny moment. Uh, a close second is of course choked up Elaine at the end, but I wanted to see the Bushman. <laughs> And my final notes, as I mentioned, Jason Alexander says in the commentary, we got the full bench playing here in this episode. So it's hard to be mad at an episode where all the parents are present. We get tastes of Newman and Peterman. I I just I just wish JLD got to participate more in the comedy portion. And my scene swap idea would be let's I just went on and on about how much I love Leo, but I could have. Had those be a little bit shaved down with Jerry, maybe maybe cut out some of Jerry's lines insulting him or lying to him and added just some more Elaine moments. Again, maybe if we're keeping the whole poppy seed thing, just some more misunderstood behaviors to fuel Peterman's suspicions. Or how could we have gotten Elaine more involved in the parental plots? Like like Greg pointed out, like maybe because she was the one who brought it up to George. Does she do they team up? Is it as a George Elaine team up to get his parents to move? At any rate, it's a very average Elaine plot in an otherwise very funny episode. And I think that's all I can say about the shower head. Please be sure to follow Hot and Heavy on social. On Insta, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. On TikTok, at Elaine Menace Podcast. And if you wish to go old school and email me, please do at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Happy New Year. And I will see you next time. <laughs>